Now, in the past several months, we have been seeing Omega starting to update many of their watches. We did a review of the new Speedmaster Moonwatch, which I can link to in the description down below to that actual video. But today, what I wanted to do was look at the new Seamaster 300, a personal favorite model from the Omega collection and kind of just talk about a few different things in particularly looking at this new blue dial variant that I think looks sweet. Uh, but basically just the rundown of what we're gonna be doing today. First, just an overview of the Seamaster collection, kind of where this one sits, you know, where it's positioned. Also talk about this new model and how it's a bit different. And then finally, looking how this watch stacks up to maybe the previous variation, the other Seamasters, as well as just the market in general and where this one falls. But let's jump into it. Now, before we jump into this video, guys, I do wanna mention that we now have dedicated watch specialists on teddybaldasar.com that are, you're able to book a consultation with. I am very excited about this because this was something that I really wanted to have, just watch nerds being able to help other watch nerds try to make a purchase. Uh, so all the people that you would be talking to have been in the industry for over a decade. Uh, one of our leaders here would be Steven. He worked at places like Torno. He was actually a, uh, working at Omega as well at one of their boutiques. So a lot of experience with the people you'd be talking to. So just wanna mention this because uh, this was very important to me. So if you have anything that you're interested in on teddybaldasar.com, please don't be shy, book a time. This is what they're really there to do. And just wanted to make this feature known to you all that are watching as well. When it comes to the Omega Seamaster, it's a name that can be traced all the way back to 1948. Though it was not until 1957 when the first of the now traditional dive watch format in the rotating bezel was debuted. Today, along with the Speedmaster, the Seamaster is easily one of Omega's best-selling collections, complete with an impressive selection of models, each with dozens of variations that can overwhelm even the biggest of watch nerds with its size. To set this stage as we dig into this Seamaster 300, we should take a moment to consider the modern Seamaster collection as a whole and how this watch fits into the overall picture. Without a doubt, the Seamaster that receives the most fanfare and attention from enthusiasts is the Seamaster Diver 300. It's a professional diving oriented, but still luxury watch, complete with a manual helium release valve, a signature wave engraved dial, as well as a notable James Bond connection. In addition, the Diver 300 is also Omega's entry-level diver, starting at $4,900 on a rubber strap or $5,200 on the excellent but very 90s style bracelet. The Seamaster 300, in contrast, lives under Omega's heritage umbrella, taking a hefty dose of vintage design inspiration from the Omega Seamaster 300 of the late 1950s and 1960s, combined with much of Omega's up spec in regards to its 8,900 movements. In terms of why the Diver 300 is probably more popular, pricing is certainly a main reason, as this 300 clearly is positioned as an even more luxurious piece compared to the more utilitarian luxury watch that is the Diver 300, with a not so insignificant price increase on these for $1,300 over the Diver 300, uh, to these being around $6,500 for this bracelet equipped variant that will in turn heighten expectations. So as we're getting into this watch, it is important to know that we did cover the previous generation Seamaster 300 about a year ago. Speaking to my personal preference to this model family compared to the Diver 300, uh, really got into the idea that, you know, I kind of like this one a little bit more and kind of the heritage that it's going for with it. Uh, but in terms of what we're gonna be looking at here, gonna really concentrate on what is new with this version and either how they've improved or what has kind of just mostly changed. Starting with the area, what I would probably consider as the most easily detected change when putting the watch on the wrist, is going to be the dimensions. Now the case of the Seamaster 300 retains its 41 millimeter diameter, yet impressively shaves off almost a full millimeter of thickness from the 14.5 millimeters to 13.7 millimeters. Now this 0.8 millimeter drop in size might not seem like a lot, but when you factor in a good portion of the thickness coming from a highly domed sapphire crystal and getting a sense of its wear, this is a big improvement and definitely a noticeable one from the previous version. In terms of lug to lug, this new version wears relatively the same, if not shaving off a fraction uh, at 47.8 millimeter by my measurements. On the wrist, these updates, especially the slimmer thickness, add up to an improved wearing experience even over the previous version, which still I think wore pretty good, all things considered, even that thickness. And while the 41 is on the larger side for some wrists out there, this watch certainly wears closer to that of a 40 millimeter when putting it on the wrist, 
with sloped and faceted case flanks, aiding in a bit of that optical illusion that makes this piece feel even smaller overall when viewed head on. There are brands like Tudor, for example, that kind of have more slabbed off sides. That can really hurt with kind of breaking apart the thickness. Now, focusing on the case and bracelet finishing, we have a dressier execution of a vintage Seamaster DNA with a mix of brush and polished surfaces throughout the case top and lugs with a well-executed bevel traveling along the outer lug edges. At the three o'clock, a new conical screw down crown allows for the watch's 300 meters of water resistance, but does so without adding the protection of crown guards. Though if I had to imagine, I don't see many people taking this one to its full paces as a diver. And in one of my favorite aspects of this model family as a whole, the almost universally unnecessary helium release valve is absent here, assisting in both wearing dimensions across the wrist and in my opinion, making the watch feel, I would just say more attractive in its design. A little bit of personal preference here, but that is one of the main reasons why I enjoy this model a bit more. In contrast to the previous version's bracelet with a polished center link and brushed outer links, this bracelet, which meets at the case at a somewhat unfortunate size of 21 millimeters in lug, so odd number here. It does though lean into an opposite execution with polishing along the outer links and vertical brushing on the center links. Now the polishing on the links and the anterior side of the case on those lugs is differing in its reflection to develop distinct lines and separation. However, there is no question that the inclusion of the polished elements in the bracelet make the watch a bit more blingy than some might like, including vintage purists that enjoy the functional tool uh, kind of origins of that 57 original. Now that said, one of the issues with the polished center links was the scratches were just much more common and easier to detect. With this move, this should improve this watch and showing its battle scars a bit less. In keeping with vintage undertones, the bracelet also tapers down to around 16 millimeters at the milled push button clasp, which is polished at its edges and features a push and slide expansion system that is elegant and well executed, offering approximately six millimeters of additional length when needed without the need for tools. Approaching the front of the watch, a blue 120 click unidirectional divers elapsed time bezel rests atop the case with also talking about the material here because this is a bit new as well. Omega classifies this as an oxalic anodized aluminum. So this is kind of a proprietary compound that they've developed. It's a bit more of a traditional material compared to ceramic iterations, but Omega claims the special anodizing process brings the insert up to 500 Vickers on the hardness scale. So that's about double that you would get from a standard aluminum insert. In addition, the indices are filled with superluminova and the bezel overall looks very much the same to the naked eye compared to the previous iteration. So the use of this material is a bit different, but if you had to say what Omega was going for, really kind of just solidifying this as that vintage offering or heritage offering from the Seamaster collection. So an interesting point here with this variation of the Seamaster is that this one comes in stainless steel. Now why this is important, because the previous generation, the blue colored variants were owned by titanium cases making this a welcome addition to the 300 family at a more approachable price than those titanium versions. Now, while the previous version demonstrated a relatively close adherence to the original Seamaster 300 watches of decades past, this new iteration comes even closer to that design with a major reduction in dial text that previously indicated its master coaxial caliber with text at the six o'clock. The three-dimensional effect of having recessed cutouts in the dial to mark the hours and the four large numerals set within the central part of the dial remains, giving way to the watch's superluminova underneath. Text is kept very minimal with the Omega signature at the 12 and the Seamaster 300 written at the six. In terms of the color palette here, this dial features a matte blue color to match the bezel with a sort of granular texture when viewed underneath the macro lens, info loom on the handset, the markers, and the bezel insert. A feature that some people are either going to love or hate, but this one also comes with multicolored loom and glows reasonably well with its incandescence, though more traditional loom as utilized on the Diver 300 series seems to work just a bit better in practice. Again, to contrast from the older version, the new 300 includes a lollipop pop tip to its second hand as opposed to the triangular execution from the former model. Now this is a design trait that was recently made famous by the James Bond Spectre edition. Looking at the dial as a whole and comparing it to something like the Seamaster Diver 300 with its wave dial, there's no question that the laser engraved wave and glossier texture is going to pop a bit more than this. But in terms of staying true to the Seamaster origins, this is really what this model aims to represent. So this watch's predecessor relied on the master coaxial caliber, the 8400. It was essentially a no-date variation of Omega's 8500 caliber and was already equipped with much of Omega's up spec in the movement department, including twin barrels in order to maximize the power reserve and to maintain consistent amplitude over the entire 
winding or power reserve. It also had a silicon balance spring for shock and assistance against magnetic resistance up to 15,000 Gauss while also being chronometer certified. Now with this 8912 we have in this new iteration, it takes essentially all the strong points of those previous 8400 calibers and adds the METAS or the master chronometer certification, which includes eight strenuous tests, including an up accuracy standard of zero to plus five seconds a day, a range of deviation that is higher than that of the standard of COSC, while also testing up the watch fully cased out rather than just the movement. If you want more details on all the tests, there is pretty good documentation on this on Omega's website. But one point I will mention here is there's definitely some confusion with the previous versions because on the dial and kind of in the marketing materials, it was mentioned as being a master coaxial, but that is not necessarily meaning that it is a Metas certified uh, movement. So that is kind of the confusion that even kind of threw me for a loop, but a lot of these 8400 and 8500s that were being just unveiled, uh, that was before the Metas collaboration and uh, actual just certification that was coming. So that's kind of the confusion there. It was basically those tests being set up, but it was not actually getting a third party body being able to test those. So just wanted to mark that kind of distinction as well. And like the majority of Omega's offerings at this price, this caliber is of course equipped with the coaxial escapement, an escapement system pioneered by Dr. George Daniels that utilizes three pallets rather than the traditional Swiss lever with two pallets in order to reduce sliding friction and should in theory increase the service interval as you're going about owning this watch. Now adding to the range of specifications for the 8912, it also has a lot of visual allure. With the Geneva style waves executed in a spiral pattern across the bridges and the rotor, some interesting directional grain at the rotor's outer circumference, and then also perlage on that base plate. While the beauty of the dive watch's caliber isn't always a major talking point, I see the level of finishing being pretty excellent compared to the competition here. It is machine finished, but still very good. And when you flip this one around and show somebody that may have never owned a mechanical luxury watch before, it probably will wow them, no question. In terms of general operation here, we're looking at 25,200 vibrations per hour, or 3.5 hertz, pretty much the coaxial beat rate that you're gonna find time and time again. It does feature hacking and hand winding, so hacking stopped in the second hand when you pull out the crown to the farthest position, and comes with a power reserve of 60 hours. All right, so now to unpack here, let's just kind of look again at what is different here compared to the previous version, and then also where this one kind of stacks up both within Omega's catalog, and then also just in the market in general, and kind of what is this catering to? Now, the first thing you're gonna notice is the case thickness. Now, this thing is thinner. It's a great improvement from the previous versions. That was probably the number one downside of that previous version. So a great just movement in the right direction. Also, now there is a difference between the polishing elements of the case, mostly with that bracelet. I think there's going to be improvement here as well with just its ability to probably not show its wear as much. Polished center links typically get scratched pretty easily, so that's a nice, uh, I think, change here as well. Would it be nice to see a brush case altogether, and would that probably be more true to the traditional kind of tool watch roots of the original 1957? I think so, but that's for another day. Also, this one is now available in a blue dial and stainless steel, so that's gonna make it a little bit more attainable to get a blue dial version of this. And then you also are getting the new change second hand, so you have the lollipop tip, and then the Metas certified movement here compared to the previous generation that was a uh, kind of produced before a lot of that master Met, uh, Metas chronometers are going to be unveiled. And then you also have the new bezel insert with this one coming in a anodized aluminum, which is gonna have up resistance against scratches compared to a traditional aluminum, but not gonna have the same look as ceramic or maybe as high resistant to scratches as that. So kind of leaning again, more into the heritage direction. Now, first looking at this one, comparison, say to the probably number one competitor to this this one has, and that's going to be the other Seamaster models, one probably being the Diver 300. In terms of this one and what it's going for compared to that one, there are things that I think lean in the favor of this one versus the other one, but also there's definitely reason to go for the Diver 300 as well. If you want the most attainable Seamaster watch, it is also probably a bit more flashy with its finish, then you probably want to go for the Diver 300. There's a lot of reasons to go in that direction rather than this one. Also, uh, one thing I will mention, there is no helium escape valve on this, and in terms of wearability, I think this one wears a bit more compact, so if uh, being just a more wearable wash, if you have a smaller wrist, I think you're gonna have a little bit more fun with this one compared to that variation. And then also, if you're somebody that probably just enjoys the more heritage uh, highlights from Omega and what dive watches were in the past, you're gonna probably like this one a bit more than the Diver 300. But there's no question that the dial finishing, it's a bit more striking on the Diver 300 with that wave dial uh, compared to this variation that has a completely different execution. But in terms of where this one is sitting in the marketplace, why these I think are very interesting where they're sitting is you have the Tudor Black Bay, you have the Diver 300, and then you kind of have this one 
in the middle of kind of no man's land in some ways. It's kind of that next step between this and then also getting up to that Rolex Submariner territory where it is, if you have say $6,000 to spend, this, this watch I would say kind of owns this price range. Is it worth the extended price up from that of the Diver 300? That is really up to you and it's gonna come down probably to do you value the heritage direction? Is it more around just having the best bang for your buck? In that case, maybe go for the Diver 300. In terms of my own personal taste, I like the heritage look of this one. I think there's still ways that this watch could be utilized even further in the future, but the upgrades I think are good to see, uh, mostly with the wearability, that's great. I think just nobody likes a thick watch, even if you have bigger wrists, I think everybody likes the idea of having a thinner watch on the wrist, no matter what your wrist size is. So that's, I think, a universal step in the right direction. And in terms of just a solid, well-built, well-constructed watch that stays true to the heritage values of the brand, I think the Seamaster 300 and these new variations are definitely a win for Omega. But all right, guys, I'd love to see your comments down below. What do you think of this new variation of the Seamaster 300? How do you think it stacks up compared to the competition, even within Omega's Seamaster collection? Because there is even competition there. Uh, it might be its greatest enemy, to be honest with you. Uh, but I'd love to see your comments down below and what you guys are thinking about this one. If you did enjoy the video and you found it helpful, thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Really would appreciate that as well. And then in addition, definitely take advantage of that watch consultation feature on teddybaldasar.com. Full authorized dealer of all the brands that we carry. And those dedicated watch specialists can help you out with anything that you're looking at on the website so you can make the right purchase. Basically watch nerds helping out other watch nerds in your decision process. No hard selling, just trying to help people out. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.